everyone, welcome to my second video. In this video, I will be explaining why I don't believe in the current conception of gender identity. Uh, this is a critique of modern transgender activism that I've been sitting on for a while, and I finally decided to make it into a video. From what I understand, the phrase gender identity in psychiatry refers to the cognitive labelling of the self as either male or female, which is influenced by biological sex alongside cultural expectations and cognitive development. In turn, gender identity organises one's own behaviour alongside the cultural expectations that give meaning to the gender identity. In other words, if your gender identity is female, you start to act according to what your culture deems feminine, which brings meaning to your gender identity. This doesn't necessarily mean all your behaviours will be stereotypical, but still, the culture at least partially defines your own personal views on what a woman ought to be. Gender identity formation starts from a very young age, with even toddlers aged 3 being able to identify masculine and feminine toys as well as their own sex. As children grow a bit older, they begin to understand the concept of gender consistency, which means one's sex being stable over time. In other words, you can't change your sex, and superficial changes in appearance or behaviour do not change sex. Young children have some plasticity in their gender identity, but once they hit puberty, their gender identity is typically set, which means their gender identity will from that point onwards no longer change. This explains why young children might outgrow their cross gender identity, whereas older children typically do not. There is some evidence to suggest that children with gender dysphoria are cognitively delayed in their gender identity formation. A famous example is Jess Jennings. Other misconceptions people have is they think I was too young to transition. They don't understand mm. how a two-year-old could know what the difference is between a boy and a girl yep. and i guess they don't understand that two-year-olds really do have the concept of genders you know i gravitated towards dolls and dresses and that's what i associated with being female mm -hmm. and that's just who i was and uh, the issue and pardon me for i'm gonna get into it the genitalia did you just feel like you had the wrong genitalia well when i was so young i didn't even know the difference between genitalia yeah. i just i knew i thought the way I classify gender was boys like trucks and blue and girls like pink pink and dresses. But then, you know, I would take baths with my brothers and my sisters and I'd see the different private parts and I'd say, why don't I have my sister's body because I'm a girl? And that's when I, I started figuring it out a little bit. What these clips are showing is that Jazz's conception of what makes a girl and what makes a boy is very heavily coated in sexist stereotypes. And he pretty much literally thinks that he is a girl because he is feminine and he hasn't really grown out of that idea or so it seems. So we discussed the principle of gender constancy earlier and so children understand that their sex cannot be changed even when they change up their hairstyle or their clothing and Jazz doesn't truly seem to understand this because again he thinks that uh, you know these shallow things like your hairstyle or the toys you play with define your gender so that kind of shows that his gender identity formation was somewhat delayed. In general gender dysphoric children might not understand that sex is immutable when picturing their future selves, they might picture an adult of the other sex. When drawing a self-portrait, they might draw a person of the other sex. This isn't directed at the definition of gender identity in psychiatry, however. Rather, my critique is based on the transgender activist definition of it. While transgender activists may not all agree on one definition, I think a general conception of gender identity revolves around feeling like a man, a woman, both, or neither, all to varying degrees. In other words, gender identity is conceptualized as a feeling that might slowly change over time for some people, whereas it remains consistent for others. Some people also believe their gender identity changes every single day, yet it remains consistent in the sense that it keeps changing, sometimes to the same limited amount of identities. I have the following critiques of this conceptualization, not presented in an order that signifies importance. <laughs> Identity, as conceptualized by transgender activists, is not verifiable. As such, it cannot be considered a scientific theory. If someone claims to identify as a man, it is impossible to verify this claim. Likewise, it is impossible to refute this claim. Transgender activists never truly explain what it means to feel like a man, and as such, we have nothing to go by. One's gender identity cannot be disputed as the subject of science, so the trans discourse doesn't allow itself to be governed by the scientific method. The debate is, as such, purely organized by ideological beliefs and moral beliefs alone. Thank you.
plus one's gender identity cannot be disputed, the only person who truly knows your gender identity is yourself, it can also not be disputed legally. The law cannot define what it means to identify as a man or a woman or anything else, and as such, legal protections for women fall flat. After all, if someone lies about their gender identity for various reasons, nobody can prove they are in fact lying. We ought to take their word for it because nobody else can truly understand the inner experience of another person. Notice how other legal protections for other demographics do not operate the same way. If someone doubts your religious, political, racial or sexual identity, that can be disputed in court. Yet, in a case such as the Jessica Yaniv case, nobody is allowed to question Yaniv's gender identity as a woman. Again. There is no way to verify Yaniv's gender identity, which did have legal implications in this case. The court had to presume that Yaniv is indeed a transgender woman, regardless of Yaniv's physical presentation or surgical status. If anyone is allowed to claim a certain gender identity without question, then legal protections for women fall flat, because law enforcement cannot decide who does and who doesn't count as a woman. In short, gender identity as conceptualized by transgender activists renders legal sex-based protections useless. If a man wants access to a woman's rape shelter, he can simply claim he is a transgender woman and there's no legal evidence that would point towards the contrary. Mind you, I'm not saying that transgender women are the sexual predators here. Rather, non-transgender men can abuse the law in such a way that they can take advantage of laws that are supposed to protect the transgender population. <laughs> Transgender activist conceptualization of gender identity presumes that gender identities are natural variances. The idea is that most people are cisgender, whereas a minority is transgender or non-binary, similar to how most people are right-handed and a minority is left-handed. The problem with this conceptualization is that it doesn't take into account that a transgender identity is or can be the symptom of a psychiatric disorder, which would be gender dysphoria. In other words, rather than this being a natural variance, it is a psychiatric problem that is the cause for great amount of distress in gender dysphoric people. By insisting that transgender identity is a natural variance instead, the struggle of many gender dysphorics is erased. The term gender identity these days is very confusing because the transgender activist definition of it doesn't stay true to its roots in psychiatry. The transgender activist definition has little to do with science and more so with personal philosophy and morality. <laughs> Transgender activists don't seem to acknowledge that a child's gender identity might change with the aid of therapists, which contradicts the scientific literature. On top of that, they consider genuine therapy to be conversion therapy, and thus they campaign for an affirmative form of treatment. This might prove itself to be detrimental for many gender dysphorics, as many gender dysphorics will eventually desist, especially if they are still young. On top of that, if one's gender identity ought not to be questioned, then many people might receive a false positive diagnosis for gender dysphoria. I predict that the affirmative model of treatment will result in many people receiving cross-sex hormonal therapy and SRS when they might regret that at a later stage in their lifetime. The number of so-called detransitioned people seems to be growing, partially because gatekeeping is deemed transphobic by transgender activists. Again, this is because a therapist ought not to question someone's gender identity according to transgender activists. <laughs> Gender identity as conceptualized by transgender activists doesn't allow for a proper, full-fledged feminist analysis of patriarchy. If womanhood can't be defined, we cannot theorize about why and how women are oppressed under patriarchy. We can't identify tools of oppression based on sex because that would include transgender men, female to males, while excluding transgender women, male to females. It is hard to find something that forms the basis of female oppression that is shared by women and transgender women alike, while also excluding transgender men. It is hard to understand why and how a female gender identity allows for female oppression. A gender identity refers to one's inner experience, not the way they navigate the world around them. As such, closest to transgender women are perceived as men by the surroundings, which means they are put in a privileged position. After all, nobody can oppress a person for being a woman if it is unclear or unknown that this person is in fact a woman because everyone is presumed to not be transgender, cisgender if you will. Transgender women are presumed to be non-transgender men. If you're presumed to be a man, you most likely won't face discrimination for that, let alone misogyny. Transgender women were as such never denied the right to vote, for example, or the right to own property. Conversely, this is true for transgender men, given that they were and are oftentimes perceived as women. <laughs>
addition to point number five, gender identity as conceptualized by the transgender movement doesn't allow for a proper analysis of the oppression of homosexual and bisexual people. If a lesbian transgender woman is perceived as a man, she will also be perceived as a heterosexual man. Her relations with non-transgender women will also be perceived as being heterosexual. As such, it is unclear how or why a lesbian transgender woman would face homophobic violence or oppression. On top of that, the reasons why homophobic people feel disgusted or hated for homosexuals oftentimes do not apply to transgender women who are lesbians and gay transgender men. Religiously inspired homophobia, for example, sees homosexual relationships as lesser because they cannot result in the birth of a child. However, if a male-to-female woman dates a woman, and if a female-to-male man dates another man, they can both result in the birth of a child. The idea that every gender identity is valid, as proposed by transgender activists, doesn't allow for debate or criticism. Any skeptic is automatically deemed transphobic, even if she or he is overall very sympathetic to the transgender movement. This doesn't allow for fair debate, as the debate is almost entirely confined to an ideological framework that everybody is expected to adhere to. Opponents are not on equal footing in the identity politics circus, and one's own gender identity is oftentimes used as a deflection. <laughs> as such, it becomes almost impossible to argue with transgender activists because they aren't able to step outside the ideological framework. Gender identity, again here as conceptualized by transgender advocates, can be validated by sexist stereotypes including clothing, hairstyles, mannerisms, social norms, hobbies, you name it. This goes against the feminist movement's efforts to degender all of these things. Remember clothes have no gender? The feminist movement seeks to disassociate these things with either men or women because these associations are almost entirely purely cultural and do not reflect innate qualities of either men or women. In other words, the feminist movement seeks to normalize defying gender norms. While the transgender movement claims to share this belief, the reality is quite different. The gender norms that transgender people claim to project are, in reality, the very things that validate their gender identities. When starting their transition, most transgenders end up changing their hairstyle and wardrobe, thus implying that gender non-conformity is the natural expression of a transgender identity. This reinforces the sexist idea that femininity is the natural expression of women and that masculinity is the natural expression of men. The idea that gender identity as an inner experience can be expressed outwardly through gender stereotypes is very problematic and sexist. Sometimes this backfires against gender non-conforming people, such as in 2015 when the Scottish Gay Pride Parade banned drag queens. It was argued that drag queens, being feminine men, make a mockery out of transgender women. In general, gender identity expression relies on a larger cultural understanding of gender. For example, it is understood in Western contemporary culture that women wear their hair long, while men wear it short. It is this framework that allows people to express a transgender identity through their hairstyle. If hairstyles were engendered in the first place, they wouldn't be used as tools for gender expression. In order for a transgender woman to express her identity through hair, the majority of women must have a particular hairstyle that the trans transgender woman can also adopt. As such, the transgender movement doesn't really seek to break the gender binary. Most transgenders rely on gender norms to be able to signify their transgender identity. However, this requires upholding oppressive gender norms in the first place. Without such norms, it would be impossible to validate gender identities through shallow changes in appearance and behaviour. That's all I have for this video. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more content. Bye!